no more. What do we know of the opposition of God? We talk a great deal about His comfort and His love. But what do we know of the opposition? Last time we were together in Revelation 6, we made note of the fact that we live between the comings. First coming took place over 2,000 years ago, just a bit over, and the second coming we still wait for, and we live in that in-between time. We noted that uh, with the creatures who are active in chapter 6, the Lord Himself opening seals, the creatures responding, the horses coming forth, we noted that heaven was engaged. Heaven is engaged. We do not live in a world where heaven is absent, where heaven is indifferent. Heaven is engaged with purpose and intent. The Spirit of God is constantly moving constantly moving in every, every quarter of this globe, striving with men, striving with women, making note of the aspirations of men, the rebellions of men, and yet countering those moves with the work of the Holy Spirit and, and God's intent to get a hold of human hearts to make them His own. To make our hearts a place where His Holy Spirit dwells and He has free reign over our lives. And so we saw at the head of this chapter, chapter 6, the first seal is opened and the white horse rides. And the white horse is the Gospel of Jesus Christ going forward in power and as that Gospel is preached, as that message is told, hearts are one. People surrender to the Lord. People bow before Him. People say like Thomas did, doubting Thomas, when the Lord stood before him and, and the Lord said, Thomas, you're struggling with doubt. Put your, put your hand in My wounds. And Thomas did that and he fell at his feet and he said, My Lord and My God. That's what the Lord's after, isn't it? The Holy Spirit working in the world, moving here and there and everywhere. Primary purpose, His sole purpose is to win hearts so that people learn to bow before Him day in and day out and say, My Lord and my God, I am Your servant. What do You have for me today? The white horse is riding. As I contemplated this in my office yesterday, my mind started going to the different stories of Christian mission that I had read. Hudson Taylor in China, Corey Tinboom and her sister in a German gulag, not a gulag, that's Russian, a German concentration camp. Uh, the gospel message moving. You can think all down through history where this gospel horse has ridden and hearts have come to enshrine Jesus Christ as Lord. It's glorious. But then what of these other three horses? Verse 3, when He broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. 
When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come, I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him. Authority was given them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. What do we do? We read of the first horse and we're rejoicing. It's good news. Going forth to conquering and to conquer, we rejoice. We expect even more of those good things and and we read on and, and instead we read of war and famine and finally death by various awful means. What do we do with this? What is the meaning of the second and third and fourth horses as they ride out onto the scene of onto the uh, the track of of human history some say that and there in attempts to uh, attempts to interpret the passage they say that these horses are just kind of general signs of conflict we're in a great controversy after all this great battle between good and evil and and so War and famine. Famine often comes on the heels of war and and the general decay and breakdown. These other problems come in. And so they say that what we see here is just the fact that even though the Lord had come once, He hasn't come twice yet. And and the the whole earth is still embroiled in, in terrible conflict. So they point to this idea of conflict. Others, others seek to root or to explain each of these horses and the, and the descriptions given about what happened when they rode out onto the scene. Others seek to find historical events. They comb the history books and they look and they say, well, this could be this particular event, this particular war, and here a bit later in history we have, we have this this famine that developed in in this part of the earth. And and so they try to tie this to specific historical events. But others, other students of of this passage have have, uh, looked at it and reflected and, and searched through their Bibles and they've come to the conclusion that what we see here in this emphasis on war and famine and pestilence and death by pestilence and wild beast, they've come to the conclusion that what we see here are signs of covenant curses. Covenant curses. God's opposition in the face of apostasy. God's, the Gospel has gone forth. People have embraced that Gospel. Christian churches have formed. But over time, we know, don't we, from, from chapters 2 and 3 in Revelation that, that it's been a challenge for God's people all down through history to stay on God's road. It's so easy to drift aside, to lose focus, to become preoccupied with other things, to let the world around us squeeze us into its mold. It's so easy for these things to happen. Not only that, you, you read of, of the churches in chapters 2 and 3, and, and uh, you have Ephesus first, and, and even Ephesus in all its glory right there at the, at the end of the 
of the gospel period, of the, the great powerful movements that we read of in the book of Acts, even Ephesus has lost their focus. The Lord has somehow drifted from, from their, their vision and, and all they see is orthodoxy and We've got to maintain orthodoxy. You move on down, Pergamum's pretty faithful, but then um, after Pergamum comes uh, Thyatira. By the time you've got to Thyatira, I miss Smyrna there, but Smyrna's faithful. Then Pergamum comes, and they start to fall away even more. We even have talk of, of immorality and things sacrificed to idols, pagan ideas coming in. Fire tire is even worse. The church begins to drift. And so knowing of this drift, knowing of what Paul said when he left Ephesus, he said, Wolves will come in dressed in sheep's clothing and they'll tear the flock. And then in the letter to the Thessalonians, he said, no, no, the Lord cannot come. The second coming will not, will not come to, to, to happen until there's first been a falling away, an apostasy. So in the light of this broader picture, some scholars have said that what you see here Students of the Bible say that what you see here in these difficult events being described, war and famine and death, what you see here is God's opposition to His people because of their drifting away, their moving away from His counsel and His will and even their rebellion against the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, I happen to favor this third interpretation as I've dug into it and studied through it and, and looked here and there in the Scripture. It's the one that is most convincing to me. But let me show you why. Let's just look together at, at a few passages. We want to note again that in the passage we've just read in chapter 6, there are certain key elements. Let me just list them again so that they're fresh in our minds. First of all, in the second horse, we had the advent of war. Peace was taken from the earth. And the symbol that was given there was that of the sword. That's in verses 3 and 4. But then moving on to verses 5 and 6, it's famine that is pictured. So we have the sword and then we have famine. And then in, uh, in the, the fourth seal, verses 7 and 8, we have death. And death comes by various means by way of sword, famine, and pestilence. It's quite interesting. This, this last, this fourth seal seems to almost gather up the seals which have come before it, and it's almost like an even greater accent. A heavier note is being sounded in this fourth seal. All of the calamities have, have now joined together. And so keeping these things in mind, sword, famine, and pestilence, we want to look at some verses in the Old Testament together. Turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. First Chronicles chapter 21. Outside of the books of Moses, this is the first time in the Scripture record where you find these three elements together. 1 Chronicles 21, I'll just give you some background. The story here is that David is late in his reign and uh, Satan comes and begins to tempt David. And his temptation is kind of along these lines. David, look what a great and powerful king you have become. Don't you wonder sometimes if maybe you're even more powerful now than your neighbors? Why don't you number and see how many soldiers you can muster? This is the line of temptation that comes to him. 
Well, David falls. He falls to that temptation. Satan incites him, and he falls. He takes the bait. He takes the bait, even though Joab, his general, said, David, we shouldn't be doing this. And then we come down to verse 7, and it reads like this, God was displeased with this thing. He was displeased. It sounds like opposition to me. Does that sound like opposition to you? Beginning of a bit of opposition, God is displeased. But then it says he was displeased, so he struck Israel. He struck Israel. And David said, David immediately responds, David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing. But now please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. The Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and speak to David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose for yourself one of them, which I will do to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Take for yourself. Now listen carefully what he's offered. And see if you can hear any connection to that which we've been reading in Revelation chapter 6. Verse 12, Take for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be swept away before your foes while the sword of your enemies overtakes you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord, and then he translates what he means by the sword of the Lord, even pestilence in the land. Well, this is quite interesting, isn't it? Does this sound familiar to you? Do you hear any echoes of Revelation 6 here? Did you hear the three elements? The Lord says, as a consequence of your iniquity, your, your disobedience to my call and my name, I'm offering you three things. You can have famine or sword or pestilence. One of these will happen to you. The opposition of God. Turn over to the book of Jeremiah. As we turn there, just notice that in this passage we just read, it's not the enemies of God. It's not the wicked who are being offered the choice of famine, sword, or pestilence. It's David. It's God's man. The king on, on the throne in Jerusalem. It's the people of God being chastened, experiencing the opposition of God. Look in Jeremiah 14, verse 12. Israel has become, Israel and Judah become very rebellious at this juncture. So, verse 11, we might as well take that in. The Lord says to Jeremiah, Do not pray for the welfare of this people. Don't pray for their welfare. Don't ask heaven for their good. When they fast, I am not going to listen to their cry. And when they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I'm not going to accept them. It sounds like heaven is stopping up its ears. Rather, I am going to make an end of them by sword, famine, and pestilence. Do you see it again? Those elements that we saw in Revelation 6, same elements, sword, famine, and pestilence. And here God is moving against His people because of their rebellion, and He's saying, I'm going to make an end of you by sword, famine, and pestilence. Go over to, to Jeremiah 24. Jeremiah 24, verse 10. Same idea, just repeat it again. 
I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence upon them until they are destroyed from the land which I gave to them and their forefathers. Jeremiah 38, verse 2. Thirty-eight, verse 2. Thus says the Lord, He who stays in this city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans will live and have his own life as booty and stay alive. You see these elements? Do you see how what we saw in, in, in Revelation 6 as the second horse and the third horse and the fourth horse rode? Do you see these, these same elements, how they're, they're clustered together and repeated here in these various contexts in the Old Testament? And if we looked even more broadly, and I'll just mention it now, we won't dig into it deeply, but you might do so at home. What is actually being expressed here is a repetition of the covenant curses. You say, covenant curses, what are those? Well, if you were to go back to, to Leviticus chapter 26, you may make note of that. I'm not going to read them this morning, but if you want to explore for yourself, Leviticus chapter 26, Deuteronomy chapter 28, you have expression of the covenant curses. God's people had been redeemed. They had been brought to Him. Tremendous mercy and grace had been shown to them. He said, you are mine. You are my people. And I will do everything I can to bless you. And if you will trust Me and you will walk with Me and you'll listen to My voice, He said, I'll, I'll just bless you until you can't even handle it anymore. It will be so rich. He tells them all that. Those are the covenant blessings. And that's what God wants for us, isn't it? That's what He wants for us. That's His goal for us. But then He says, on the contrary, if you resist and you rebel and you wonder and you let the world around you shape you and, and, and let the world choose your life goals and, and your priorities and your purposes, and you neglect My Word, and you don't seek My face, and you don't draw close to Me, and you start to substitute other things in instead of Me. He said, if you do this, I will pursue you with sword and famine and pestilence. I will pursue you the opposition of God. You see those passages we read in Jeremiah, they're all rooted back here. The passage we read of David in, in 1 Chronicles, they're all rooted back there. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, covenant curses God's opposition when His people disobey, willfully rebel, choose another path, refuse to listen to His voice. So, so there's two things in this passage. We usually only talk about the, the white horse riding. The Gospel. Oh, there's, there's forgiveness. There's peace. Good news. I can, I can have hope. And, and we should have hope. But oh, we, we hardly ever talk about the opposition of God. What does it mean to have God moving against you? That's in the passage as well. I'm not, I'm not sure we know what to do with this. Our culture, our culture has swung so wide of this. I don't talk about wrath anymore. We don't talk about God's retributive justice. We don't talk about the judgment that will come upon sin. Oh no, we give these things wide berth. Stay away from that. It's too frightening. You might trouble my heart. We don't talk about the God who 
who will move against you because He loves you. Our culture swings so wide of this. What do we do with the God who comes against? Let me ask you a question. It's rooted in, in, in what I just asked. But it develops it a bit further. How do you, how do you wrestle with the parts of your soul that you sense are diametrically opposed to God? How, how well do you wrestle with those parts of your soul? Our tendency to independence, our pride, our self-centeredness, our indifference to the needs of others and the destiny of others. All of these things, we find them in ourselves, don't we? If we're honest with ourselves, we find these things in us. How well are we wrestling with those things? How do you even come to take those aspects of yourself seriously? It can seem almost overwhelming. Well, how could I take that seriously? I'm not sure what to do about it. I'm not sure how to change. Is there really the possibility of, of not being selfish? Is there really the possibility of, of, of the whole of my life being in pursuit of His kingdom? Is there really the possibility of being of living like Jesus Christ did? Constantly aware of others and, and ways in which the Spirit can flow through me to bless them? Tireless service. Are these things really possible? Another related question. What do we do with suffering? What do we do with suffering? We've talked about God's opposition. And I think it's pretty clear that any time God moves against us, that suffering will be involved. What do we do with suffering? And the idea, the idea that God that God just might, maybe, the Scripture alludes to this, that God, that God well may be behind our suffering in some mysterious way. Oh no, not our culture today. We, we, no, we can't handle that. Go a different direction, Pastor. God behind suffering? Oh no, no, that's not the God I serve. Not the God I know. I have a hard time with this. But what if God was behind our suffering? It's not an easy question. It's a difficult question. The Scripture does not treat human suffering in one kind of monolithic block. It's not just one simple definition of suffering. The Scripture has quite a, a number of different words to describe human pain and human suffering. And so we can't just treat it kind of monolithically. It's a difficult question. There, there's the covenant curses that we've looked at this morning. And they're kind of surprising to us that, that God can actually move against people to, to bring them to their absolute end in helplessness. No food in peril of death. Pestilence stalking. God can actually move in these ways. He does move in these ways. So we see this kind of suffering that comes from God's opposition in covenant curses. But that's not the whole story. We also look at the story of Job. And in Job's story, it's very clear. Job is, God says he's a blameless man. There's no one else like him in the whole earth. And yet Job is suffering terribly. Job is suffering the rampage of evil. And it's hard for us to understand. Why, why would God ever allow Satan to pursue Job in this way? There's mysteries there that are hard for us. 
But this is a different kind of suffering than that of the covenant curses, isn't it? Not the same kind of suffering. Not the same motivation behind it. Oh, but then that's not all. There's also these general curses that have come upon the planet. You think back to Genesis chapter 3 and what happened right after Adam and Eve uh, rebelled against God and betrayed Him, ignored His Word, cast it aside and said, we're going to do our own thing. What happened right after that? God came and He promised them redemption. He held out the hope of the white horse riding. He said that white horse is going to ride and there's hope and you don't have to be in bondage to evil, the evil that you chose. So He held out redemption, but that's not all He held out. Remember what He said to Adam? Cursed is the ground because of you and in toil and hard labor, back-breaking labor, you will eat of it all the days of your life. To Eve, He said, in pain will you give birth. And so we have another source of pain. God has cursed the whole planet in a certain kind of way, in such a way that human life is made more difficult, more painful, more trying. Why would God do these kinds of things? Oh, again, it's difficult. All of these streams of suffering, they all exist within a tension. Theologians want to sort it all out and get it all tied up in neat little boxes so that when you are suffering, you can identify, well, I'm a Job right now, or, oh yeah, I've been in rebellion, I'm, this is the covenant curses, or, or this is just the general pain of a fallen planet. They want to have it all divided up, neat and clean, so that you never have any question, no perplexity within the soul. But that's not how it works, is it? So many times when we suffer, we cannot see clearly. What is the source? What is the reason for this suffering that I taste right now in my life walk? It's hard to discern. We ask, why am I suffering? Is this a covenant curse or a rampage of evil or just part of the general conditions of things in a fallen world? And I'm not really sure it makes a difference in the end. The key question is this, no matter what the reason for your suffering, the key question is this, have I learned to profit by my suffering? Have I learned to spiritually gain by whatever suffering has come into my life? Or to put the question in a different way, do I know what it means to profit by the God who moves in opposition? Once again, we live in an age, we live in an age that has denied all of this. This movement of God in the realm of difficult things. This opposition of God. This pursuit of God. This vigorous and even heavy-handed pursuit of God in order to turn His children's hearts in the right direction. The age in which we live knows nothing of this. And my fear is that the Christian church is moving in a direction where we no longer know anything of this either. We're tempted to turn God into a big comfort bear. So no matter what you do, or, or no, no matter what choices you're making, no matter how much you're rebelling, all He offers is comfort and cuddles. It's not the God of the Bible. He will pursue you because He loves you. He will make life hard for you because He loves you. And even if you're not rebelling, you still partake of the general burden of life in a broken, fallen world. He's pursuing you even there. 
He's pursuing our hearts even there. But our age knows nothing of this. No, suffering for the modern man, the modern woman, suffering has become a mere technical problem. A technical problem. Whatever we face, we sit back, we say, well, just let us work on this a bit. Science and technology can solve it. And then we won't suffer that anymore. Oh, and we've made great strides in this direction, haven't we? And that encourage us, encourages us even more in our godless secular rebellion. We don't need God. Life goes on just fine without Him. Yes, I have my devotion in the morning, but the rest, everything else goes on just like it does in the secular world. No, suffering is just a technical problem. And where it fails us, where technology and science fail to solve the problems of our suffering, oh well, we have entertainment and multitude forms of escape. Just give me a little break. I'll find a place where these things can't touch me. The question is, who cries? Who cries out to God anymore? in the face of insoluble problems. Who cries out to God? Our society doesn't. We're falling at the feet of politicians. Even Christians in this society. Trump, a man like Trump. The great and glorious hope of the Christians because he seems to favor our interests. Yet you've hardly met a more godless, egotistical man. The other side's no better. Don't, don't try to decide which side I favor. The other side's no better. Politics is not the answer. And with all the problems that batter our lives increasingly, I mean, we despair of these things, but is it possible that this is God pursuing us because He loves us and He knows we've drifted? And, he's, and He wants to wake us back up to the fact that without Him, we have nothing. That without Him, all is lost. Is it possible that through these difficulties, through the opposition of His hand, He is crying out to us and saying, I can't reach you any other way now. Your hearts have become hard. Your ears stopped up. I'm going to have to make it hard for you because I long to turn you and bring you back to Myself. Who cries out anymore to God in the face of our problems? Oh, but the Revelator here tells us in this passage He tells us in this Revelation 6 passage that the age between the comings, between the first advent and the second advent, He's telling us something not just about their day back in the second and third and fourth and fifth centuries. He's telling us something about the whole age from the time Christ went to heaven to the time He comes back. He's telling us that that age between the comings is an age marked by God's pursuit of man as seen in suffering. The difficult condition of things. The whole of creation groaning, caught in travail, subject to futility. We dare not try to tame it We dare not try to tame this opposition of God's hands, but rather we are called to enter into it, to accept it, and to be taught by its lessons. We all so often want it to just all go away so that we can pursue our next vacation or the comfortable income or whatever it is, will just make it all go away so I can live my life. But He calls us into it. 
so that we may learn its lessons. I'm tempted to preach more. We could look at Psalms 90. We could look at Psalms 39 that develops in, in powerful ways these themes. But we'll take them up next week. What I want to do right now is this. I want you to find another person here in, in, in our sanctuary. Find another person, male with male, female with female. And I want you to spend just the next seven, eight minutes together talking about the following two questions. Can you put those up on the screen for me, Ken? Got those there. I want you to find a friend and just spend a little time together talking about what share with each other. You don't have to go into gory detail or share more than you're comfortable sharing. But share with each other what has caused you suffering. And the second question, have you known God's presence in your suffering? So go ahead, find another person, and take a few moments to share on these questions together. Oh, and then after you've shared, pray, pray for each other in respect to what has been shared. At about noon, or maybe just a couple, two, three minutes after noon, I will come back up and say a closing prayer. In groups of three or four, you feel free to do that. Um, but please, 